I don't know about you guys, but uh, so I, I've been running conferences for about 10 years, and this is the part of the day that we call the doldrums, uh, where you know you have to put some thought into programming the lineup for a conference. And you know what we learned over the years was you need to start with someone really strong, Vitaly, and you need to end with someone really strong, Allison, um, to really you know keep the crowd involved. And then you put the lesser known, less vibrant, less exciting speakers in the middle as Phil. I'm really glad to see ImageCon bucking that tradition. <laughs> right? So um, let's see. So uh, we'll do a little thing here. I'll be a little risky like uh, Tobin and Vitaly, and we'll start off with a little, uh, let's break up the doldrums. Doldrums, as you know, is that uh, area around the equator uh, best known for calm winds, but also juxtaposed by thunderstorms. So let's do a little thunderstorm here. We'll do that uh, call and response kind of cheer where, uh, you know, uh, I say coffee, you say black. Coffee. Black. Coffee. Black. Okay, are you ready? Uh, let me think of some. Uh, okay, I'm ready. We'll do three, uh, three of them. I say responsive, you say images. Responsive. Image. Responsive. I say happy, you say users. Happy. User. Happy. User. I say cloud, you say inary. Cloud. Inary. Cloud. Inary. cloud. Inary. Not canary, inary. Like cloudinary. Okay, so that's a good segue. Are we a little more awake? That was the thun yeah, there we go. That was the thunderstorm of the doldrums. Uh, so uh, that's a good segue, uh, cloudinary, because I don't know about you, I think this is a fantastic inaugural event for ImageCon. And I think we should just give them a little round of applause. Thank you very much for this. My, you know, my talk was supposed to be at two. Uh, you know, I've mostly worked with Carol and Nicole. And I got a call this morning at 9 AM from Carol asking where I was. And I thought the schedule had changed. So you know, they, they uh, curated this event with a lot of care, and we appreciate that. And you know, also maybe a thank you to the uh, speakers, uh, there uh, is a lot of time that's put into these decks. I don't know if you uh, appreciated looking at uh, Vitaly and Jason, the work that they had put into that. Um, you know, it's kind of like, it makes me feel a little bit with about what we're about to go through. I kind of feel like, you know, they're playing first chair cello in the high school orchestra, and I'm the kid in the back with the triangle, <laughs> going ding, ding. So that's self-deprecating joke number one. I use the word joke liberally. That's self-deprecating joke number two. <laughs> We're about to enter an infinite loop, so let's quickly get out of that. Let's see, what else was I going to say? I have some notes here. Uh, oh, yeah, OK, so yeah, all that self-deprecating stuff aside, I'm going to rock your world with this talk. Now, that's the way I actually feel. And then I you know, kind of try to you know, uh, normalize a little bit. I'm going to be talking about performance. Uh, in the world of web programming, like I actually think performance ranks number three. Uh, functionality, security are higher than performance. So I'm, performance isn't even number one. And that's just in the world of web development, right? And web development is a small part of the overall universe. But I do really think that there is some um, good stuff in this talk. In fact, I think it's so good. I'm going to do something that I never do. I think this is being videotaped that I never do on video is uh, I'm going to swear. There is some cool sh asterisk exclamation point in this talk. <laughs> All right, OK. There's the preamble. So yes, I was asked to talk about uh, measuring image performance. So measuring, pretty easy. You know, We've got a yardstick here we want to quantify. We also want to do this in a monitoring sort of way. Uh, we want it to be accurate and consistent and reproducible. Uh, image, you know, we're not going to be talking about SVG or video. We care about those things, but we're going to focus on images. Um, performance, ah, that one's a little trickier. What do, what do we mean by performance? Rather than come up with a definition, let's come up with some examples. Everyone in your head, you know, we're going to play, what's that game? Uh, survey says, uh, uh, think of some examples of what you would consider image performance metrics. Number one, I'm guessing, size in terms of 
uh, kilobytes. Ah, uh, number two, probably download time. How quickly can images download, right? What other, can you think of any others? Yeah? Okay, I'm not gonna ask. It's just <laughs> only two people. Because uh, I have a certain order. If you go out of order, it's gonna mess me up. Uh, you could also look at size of pixels. Why would this be interesting? Well, it's gonna tell us a lot of trends if we look at this over time. Are we, is our, uh, we're all working on a website here together. We're a great team. Uh, is our website starting to have more hero images than we had before? Um, uh, and maybe a larger number of those on the page. Or is our site populated by a lot of small images and we wanna think about, God forbid, sprites or uh, icon fonts or something like that. You know, the, you can get some in interesting information looking at the uh, actual size of the images in our pages. Certainly, I think the total number of images, the amount of images in our pages is something that's important to track and several folks, uh, Tobin and Vitaly, uh, showed stats from HTTP Archive about how that trend is happening. Um, I think another one that's really interesting, I'm at this company called Speed Curve, and despite the, the agenda, there's actually an E on the end of Speed Curve. We're spelling those two words the way they're spelled. You know, I feel sorry for this generation of kids growing up where they spell nectar with a K and a backward E. Uh, at Speed Curve, <laughs> thank you, Travis. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'll pay you later. <laughs> uh, we do this at Speed Curve. We track images above the fold. How many people have that stat for their site? Yeah. Uh, you, well, frick, sign up for Speed Curve. Uh, images above the fold, really interesting, especially if you juxtapose it with the total number of images that you have on your site. This is something Amazon does, and we all... If we don't know it, if we haven't studied it, we all know it from using the site. The incredible job that they do of getting the content that's in the viewport visible as quickly as possible, right? And so if you have 60 images on your page but only eight are in the viewport, you might wanna do something like lazy loading, right? Um, uh, of images or dynamic loading those images outside the viewport. So I think this images uh, above the fold or in the viewport is, uh, we've been tracking it for about a year. We haven't dived into it, but I think we're gonna be able to peel that onion back a couple layers and get some interesting insights out of that. Um, so some great, great uh, image performance metrics here. To be honest with you, I don't care about any of these, right? Uh, and the reason why I don't care about them is these people don't care about them, right? From the very beginning, I've been doing web performance for 15 years. Performance is a proxy for happy users. That's what I've been trying to work on and optimize for 15 years, is the experience that users have on the site. And these people don't talk about how many image requests there are there are, or what format it is, or how big the images are, right? All of these people are on phones, so actually how big the images are, they might care about a little bit because they're on data plans. Uh, probably not, though, they're at a conference. Um, so I will, I will concede, the size of images maybe is a, a, a big one for happy users, but in general, that's not what users care about when it comes to imagery. They care about seeing the images, right? We have these sites, and you go to them, and, and in some cases, the sites have uh, images that people have grown accustomed to. And they won't even start engaging with the site until that imagery is visible. Or you have something like this, where you might go to IMDB once a week or every day, and the Oscars are over, and the images on the uh, site are very different. And it's enjoyable, you go to it and it's like, oh yeah, that's right, the, the, we had the Oscars this weekend, and there was that Warren Beatty thing, and I actually think Faye Dunaway got off easy on that one. Uh, you know, it's, th this is what makes beautiful, enjoyable experiences, right? Uh, you go to Netflix, look at this background image. This is beautiful. 
And uh, another example, you know, that we all think of Airbnb or HomeAway, uh, you go to these sites and you get excited about renting a place. I mean, look at this. This is beautiful. I stayed in that castle there. That's a lie. I just got back, I just got back from Bahamas, though. Uh, I don't know about you, you know, I talked about uh, you get ingrained of what to expect when these sites are loaded, of what you're going to see. Uh, would you start filling out this form if the background image wasn't loaded? If it was just a black background or a white background, whatever it is by default? No. You would think there was something broken or there's probably some JavaScript associated with the form that hasn't loaded yet and it's going to erase anything that you type or the site's been hacked. Right? So when these images are painted, when they become visible, that's what creates a great user experience. That's what makes happy users. That's what we should be measuring. Image render time, right? Now, that's very difficult. Vitaly mentioned that early on. We're going to do that today. We're going to figure out how to do that. The reason that it is kind of difficult is because of this. This is the way every website starts loading. This is what it looks like, right? And uh, in a lot of cases, it's not like this for very long. This is not a great user experience. Uh, usually, it's not like this for very long. But in some cases, it can be like this for seconds, right? Two, three, five. I could look at the top 100 websites and find 20 of them where it looks like this for at least three seconds. Okay, so why does it look like that? Does everyone know what I'm going to say? Critical blocking resources. Scripts and style sheets. Uh, it has to do with the way that those assets affect the browser. Um, let me demonstrate this. I'm actually going to flip out of here if everything goes smoothly. Yeah, here we go. We'll make that a little bigger. So this is a uh, website I built. Uh, it actually won a web design award back in 1987. <laughs> and it's, I, I use this probably every day. Uh, what it's for is very quickly creating test cases. So I'm suggesting to you that scripts and style sheets can create this experience where no images are seen for seconds, right? And you may believe that, you may not. Uh, let's uh, also open up uh, Chrome DevTools. We've got the network open. OK, so I'm going to create a site. Uh, it's going to have an external script and an external image in it. Uh, I'm going to say that this script uh, should take, oh, I've got to get this down. There we go. Boom. Uh, I'll have this script take five seconds to download, and I'll make the image download very quickly. Zero seconds, right? This is talking to my server that knows how to interpret these requests. So now we'll create this page, this test page that we just configured. And you can look down below, and you can see that uh, here we go, all. You can see that we have this really long uh, script. It took five seconds to download. The image, though, was done downloading in like 80 milliseconds. That's a, a compliment to the hotel Wi-Fi here. So, so let's, let's reload that again and watch. I, I love the ocean. Watch these little, uh, the little image, example image. Watch how long it takes to appear. Do one, 1,000, two, 1,000 year ahead, OK? We're going to reload. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. It's done downloading. 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. The image downloaded in under 100 milliseconds, but it took five seconds before the image got displayed because a script blocks rendering in the page. So do style sheets. 
So let's delete the script. We'll add a style sheet. And we'll have it take five seconds. There we go. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. Right? So this is the problem, is there's more to images than just the image themselves. They work in this uh, ecosystem of the browser where there are a lot of interdependencies. So uh, what we can do, so this is a great tool. The thing is, I can tell everyone's wild by this. Uh, the thing is that I get a lot out of this, but this is not a real website. And so it's hard for people, especially people who aren't hardcore developers, to really get an understanding and an appreciation of how this can impact the user experience for a real website. So let's do that for a real website. Let's actually go here. This is web page test. Oh, it's pretty big. And we'll go to uh, Netflix. One of, that's one of those examples I showed before with that beautiful background. We're gonna do something, we're gonna use this feature called SPOF, where we can identify a single point of failure and have it never return, right? It's gonna take forever to return. And what resource should I use? Well, uh, I'm gonna go here to speed curve. This is speed curve, look, there's an E after <laughs> curve. And here's the Netflix site, we can see it loading. And I'm gonna find a critical blocking resource. Now this is something we do, this is the speed curve waterfall chart. We do a lot of cool things. One of the first things we did was we integrated the film strip with the waterfall. So as I scroll left to right here through the timeline, I can actually see what the screenshot looks like. And I can see which resources, which requests and responses are affecting that rendering of the site. Um, and now we actually have that in Chrome DevTools, so that's cool. I'm not saying they copied us. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've added the uh, browser CPU timeline here. So you can very easily see what's being downloaded and when that is tying up the main CPU thread because guess what? That main CPU thread affects rendering. Um, and the other thing we've done, we're, you're gonna see that pretty quickly in Chrome DevTools, I would bet. And the other one that everyone is gonna start doing is this one, where if a resource is a critical blocking resource, we color it with this hash pattern. And this lets you know, so we can see when the start render happens here, we can know which resources are affecting that start render time, either pulling it in or pushing it out. And in this case, this site is really good. They only have one critical blocking resource. The average across the world's top 500,000 websites is 14 critical blocking resources. But we can take this one, and I'm just gonna show you again, we're just in a slight digression here, uh, to uh, kind of illustrate what a critical blocking resource is. And, you know, honestly, to highlight what an incredible tool speed curve is and, you know, just raise the idea of maybe signing up for that service. <laughs> uh, so we'll take this critical blocking resource, the SPOF, the way SPOF works, the reason I went through that whole tangent there was I needed to get the domain name of a critical blocking resource. So now we have the domain name of a critical blocking resource, and I'll kick this off. And what speed cur uh, what web page test is gonna do is it's going to load that page once without blocking that domain, and it's gonna load it again with a black, ho black hole in that domain, meaning no request of that domain will ever come back. And we won't wait for the result. I have a canned result here. We can see the original pretty quickly uh, within about six or seven seconds, we get the Netflix site with that beautiful background image. But for that critical blocking resource, you can see what it's done to that. Each one of these squares is five seconds. I don't know if you can see that across the top. Yeah, five, 10, 15, 20. It turns out that Chrome is configured that if a response does not come back in 20 seconds, the, re the request is aborted. So after 20 seconds, the request for that, I think it was a style sheet, uh, was aborted, and it allowed the page to render. It looks a little broken because we bailed on a style sheet, a Netflix style sheet. Um, but what I'm trying to illustrate here 
is before I talked about the impact that that imagery has on a joyous experience and how terrible that blank white page was for uh, making users happy. And what do we have here? We have this blank white page for 20 seconds. Now, you might be thinking, okay, but this is a catastrophic event. This is if the CDN serving my style sheets and scripts that are critical and blocking uh, never responded. It's so overloaded, it's taking requests and it's never sending a response. So that's true. But how often do you find that at least one or two critical blocking resources are taking like two seconds to get back? Normally they're 500 milliseconds. They're taking two, three, maybe even four seconds to get back. I don't know, maybe 10% of the time, 5%. Let's say 10%. If the average website, ah, I'm sorry, we're gonna do math. If the average website has 14 critical blocking resources, and there's a 10% chance that uh, that could take more than, say, two or three seconds, then there is a, uh, we have to take 0.9 to the power of 14, which is, uh, you're right, Jason, 77. Uh, there's a 77% chance that one of those 14 critical blocking resources is gonna take more than three seconds, which means they won't see it. In a disastrous event, they're gonna see this blank white page for 20 seconds, but even under normal circumstances, with the intermittent behavior of the internet and various hiccups, with 14 critical blocking resources, you have a 77% chance you're gonna see the blank white page for three seconds, and that's what I experience every day. So I did this, I did this, let's go back to the talk, I did this uh, spoff for those three beautiful websites that we uh, were looking at, uh, boom, there's web page test, there's some beautiful looking performance monitoring tool. Uh, so here's those three websites, and, and sure enough, each of them have critical blocking resources, and if you block those critical blocking resources, uh, if you black hole them, you see nothing for 20 seconds, but if any of those just had a natural internet hiccup associated with them, users would have this horrendous experience of seeing the blank white page for two, three, four, five seconds, right? That is not a good experience. And so that's why I think the most important image performance metric to track is rendering. Vitaly says, can't be done, not possible. Okay, so how are we gonna do it? Ah, hero element timing. This is beautiful. I bet no one here has used this. Uh, it's an attribute called element timing. You associate it with it, a name. You assign it a name. And what this is going to do is when this element, in this case, the hero image on the page, is painted to the screen, a timing event is gonna be recorded that you can pull out with JavaScript and then you can get access to that timing uh, value, that timing metric, in your synthetic or RUM performance tracking tools that you're using, right? Perfect, this is awesome. The only problem with this is they only started talking about it a few months ago. So no one's using it because it's actually not implemented anywhere yet. There's no browser that supports this. So this is something to keep in mind. This is exactly what we need. And uh, they're talking about expanding this to uh, work for other events as well, besides paint. But to me, for images, uh, painting is the thing that we really, really care about. So we don't have that right now. It turns out that there's a hack that you can use to get a pretty good approximation of when images are painted to the screen. It doesn't take into account decoding, so if you have huge, inefficient images, there's gonna be a little lag there. But overall, if we look at the amount of time it typically takes, between when someone navigates to a page and before an image renders, we're usually talking in seconds. So, you know, less than 100 milliseconds uh, margin of error is not gonna be too significant. Um, so here's how the hack goes. Suppose you have an image, the hero image, right? If you wanna track when this image is gonna be painted, where would you start? You start with an onload handler, right? 
Because the image can't be painted until it's, it's downloaded, right? So we're going to use the uh, user timing spec for this. I'm not going to go into detail of user timing spec. Unfortunately, it's pretty uh, easy. There's these functions like mark and measure to take time measurements to, to plant time milestones in the page loading sequence. Uh, there's this extra one, clear measures. You'll see in a minute why we have to use that. But basically, what I'm saying in the onload handler for the hero image is clear any previously existing hero measurements and take a new time measurement for called hero, right? Now, this is going to be pretty good. This is going to give us uh, a pretty good approximation of when the image got painted, unless we have these critical blocking resources in the page. Suppose I have this huge, slow style sheet. Um, it's going to block this image from rendering. And as we saw in Kazillion, the onload handler for this image is going to fire after, in that case, it was like, what was it, 84 milliseconds or something like that. The onload, high, you know, the style sheet is going to block the image from getting painted, but it's not going to block it from the, having the onload fire. So the onload is going to fire in 84 milliseconds. We're going to record a hero metric that says 84 milliseconds, right? Uh, but it's not going to paint for five seconds or however long it takes for this huge slow style sheet to download. So then we add another measurement. Below the image, we add a script tag. Now, the way browsers work, this script is not going to get evaluated until the style sheet is done downloading. That's just the way browsers work. And what do we do here? We actually repeat the code that we have there. That's why we have to clear the measures. We're going to clear any previously existing hero measurements and take a hero measurement. OK. Let's imagine that this image takes 84 milliseconds to download and the style sheet takes five seconds. What's going to happen? This is going to fire in 84 milliseconds, it's going to record a hero measurement. After five seconds, the style sheet's done. This is going to evaluate. It's going to erase the previous hero measurement and take a new one. And this is when the image is painted. Let's flip that. Suppose the style sheet is in the cache, and it takes 10 milliseconds to be read from cache. And the image is actually pretty big, and it takes I don't know, one and a half seconds. What's going to happen? The style sheet's going to be read from cache. The image is going to be re requested. Images don't block scripts. The script's going to be read at 10 milliseconds. It's re going to record a hero time measurement that says 10 milliseconds. After a second and a half, or however long it takes the image to download, it's going to erase the previous one and take a new one that says a second and a half. And we have an accurate measurement for when the image gets painted to the page. We're basically taking the max of those two values. So the hero element timing API that's coming down the road is going to be more accurate. But right now, we're flying blind. I would bet that no one here has any idea of when the users can actually see the imagery on their pages. We've been doing this and some of our customers with SpeedCurve for over a year. And we're getting really good results with this. And they correlate really well when we look at our synthetic tests uh, where we have film strips of the site loading with when the imagery is actually visible across all browsers. Thank you. Um, the other thing that I mentioned here that's really important is the critical blocking resources. This is actually one of the three websites that I uh, showed uh, before. And you can see where the number of style sheets jumped from six to eight just in the last couple days. That's pretty alarming. Just that change alone raises the probability if we say a critical blocking resource has a 10% chance of taking three seconds. That raises the probability from 57% to 65% of that happening, 8%, just by adding two more style sheets. Um, so it's really important. Uh, again, we've been tracking this in speed curve uh, for a year or so. It's actually pretty tricky to do this. I wanted to talk about it. I've open sourced the code in HTTP Archive, but I want to talk a little bit about how we did it. Um, how do we count blocking critical, critical blocking resources? OK, how about blocking scripts? If a script is not async or defer, it's blocking, as long as the script tag occurs before the last DOM element that's visible in the viewport. Why is that? 
Whereas style sheets block everything in the page, scripts only block the DOM elements that follow it in the DOM tree, that follow the script tag, right? So if you have a script tag at the bottom of the page in, in the body, it's not going to block, and even if it's loaded synchronously, it's not going to block any rendering. And so we actually have written code that finds the last visible DOM element and only considers synchronous scripts that are, occur prior to that as a critical blocking resource. For style sheets, there's much less asynchronous loading of style sheets, but it's becoming more popular. Um, load CSS is one technique from the filament group. So we make sure if the style sheet, that the style sheet, if it's blocking, it's not loaded by CS, load CSS, it's not preloaded, and it's the correct media type. It's not a media type that doesn't apply. And so with this, we can get these accurate uh, critical blocking resource metrics. Now, I was being a little facetious before. I do care about these metrics. We track all of these in speed curve. Um, and uh, I think that it's best to do these in the world of, of performance metrics that are synthetic in RUM. I think it's best to do these with synthetic. I don't agree with people who say more data is better. Uh, in my experience, actually, it's worse. Uh, it's important to have the data that you need and that's relevant and doesn't distract people where they're spending a lot of time going down uh, uh, dead ends. Um, you can do this with RUM in real pages with JavaScript with the resource timing and spec. The one thing I would uh, warn is um, you should not take any resource timing values for cross-site resources, because uh, they're wrong. The values are just wrong. Uh, if you uh, are getting images from any, from servers that you own, you, even if it's a different domain name, you can use the timing allow origin and get those values. But if you can't, just don't get the data at all. It's gonna lead you to make mistakes. All right, so that's it. Let me wrap up what are the takeaways. Uh, the most important thing when it comes to images, in my mind, is to measure image render. Um, in the future, we'll be able to do that with the Hero Element Timing API. In the meantime, we can get a very close approximation with this hack that I've shown. Uh, I also think it's good to know and monitor your critical blocking resources. That's gonna help you understand why your image rendering is so slow. And really the overall point I'm trying to make with this talk is a website is a holistic experience. The imagery is the most important part of that. I think even more than text, that's what users have become ingrained in looking for and expecting from the site. But there's a lot that goes on in uh, having those images get rendered to the screen, and it's important to have an understanding of that whole uh, process. Thank you very much. All right, give it up for Steve Souders. That was awesome. And I, I believe that's speed curve with an E. Yes. Three E's, technically. All right, so do we have any questions for Steve here? He dropped some, some knowledge bombs on us about uh, image performance. That was great stuff. A question over there, question over here. Hey, hey Steve, uh, do you recommend uh, spriting and uh, font icons? Uh, you know, spriting is very, very difficult. Um, in the world of H2, definitely do not do any spriting. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you support H2, and most browsers these days support H2, I would say avoid spriting. A question over here? Yeah, um, so why shouldn't you time cross-origin requests? Because I know, for example, we use uh, you know, CloudFront or a CDN to serve every single resource on the page. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't have time to go into resource timing. I've got several uh, incredibly excellent blog posts about it on my blog that people should look at. But, and, and one of those blog posts explains this point. Uh, for resources that are same site, uh, you know, and that means they could also be a different domain, but they have the timing allow origin header, uh, you can get all this detail about it, and you can find out, uh, you know, when the request started and when it ended. Um, for security reasons, for uh, uh, cross-site resources, all you can get is a duration value. 
And that duration value includes the time uh, that the resource was blocked from being downloaded. And so when do images or resources get blocked from being downloaded? If you have more than six resources on the same domain, uh, almost every website in the world has that case, uh, then you know, anything after the first six are gonna have blocking time. But you don't know whether the duration that you're getting includes blocking time or doesn't, because that would expose the security issue. So you're gonna get some images that say, oh, we only took 200 milliseconds, and others that say, we took two seconds. And you're not gonna know if it was actually two seconds or if it's two seconds because it was blocked by 50 other images on the same domain that occurred before them. Good stuff. There we go. All right, one final round of applause right here. Oh, another question? Never mind, hold your applause. Hold it, hold it, one more second. Another question popped up. Is there a way to measure images referred to in CSS files, for example, background images? Uh, what do you mean referred to them? Oh, so suppose that you have a CSS class and you assign a uh, an image via the background image uh, attribute in CSS. Can you measure its rendering like you were doing yeah. image elements? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, you shouldn't do that. Uh, and, and Jason kind of touched on this. Uh, everything starts with the image tag. So um, the, what's the problem with doing that? Okay, so, uh, uh, and I'll tell you actually, one of those three beautiful websites does this. The hero image is actually in CSS. What's the problem with that? If that CSS is in a style sheet, so suppose I do an image tag for that beautiful background image. Uh, the browser has a preloader that uh, Jason talked about. It will see that image tag very, very early and start downloading it very, very early and it will be downloaded very quickly so it can be rendered very quickly. If instead that's a background image in a style sheet, the preloader can't see it because it can't see the style sheet. So it has to download the style sheet, so now we're way over here, the style sheet is done, and now we can see that there's a background image, so then we start downloading the background image so the background image doesn't land till here, whereas if you did it with an image tag, it would have occurred, it would have been available way back here. Even if you do it with an inline style, the preloader does not parse CSS and it will not download that background image. Um, so for images that are critical to the content of the page, like a hero image, you shouldn't do it with CSS. If you do have an image in CSS that you care about, uh, you can't track it with this hack that I have, um, but you could use resource timing and hopefully it would be uh, same site so you would not suffer from that bug. Great stuff. All right, unpause your applause. Give it up. Steve, nice job, buddy. That was great.